I'm going to demonstrate how to get one of your stock standard GoTek drives available quite cheaply from China ready for use in an ST. Uh, this is one of the beige coloured ones um, straight out of the packaging which you'll note on the back there has one jumper set already and we'll look at that in more detail later. After removing the case what we're going to do is add four pins just here. The first thing we're going to do is to add some header pins on the block there. We'll be using that for resetting the device and for flashing new firmware to it. Now, taking a close look, we see that we've got um, holes there for nine pins. We only really need, as a bare minimum, uh, four of them. We're going to do these four here. So basically, it's your transmit and receive lines for the serial connection, and there's a Last two here, uh, pins for setting the GoTech into a bootstrap mode. Here's the underside of the PCB with the four header pins soldered in place. I obviously didn't film it, I needed two hands to do it, but it was quite straightforward to do. The GoTechs come packaged with a set of jumpers and screws for mounting. Um, by default, the jumper is set on the S1 connection uh, for the Atari we need to set it on S0 and M0. The S1 however will work in the Amiga. As part of flashing the firmware the first step you have to do is apply a jumper across the two bootstrap pins there. Um, from here we'll now connect the serial interface. For this work I'm using a cheaply available USB to serial um, adapter simply plugs in there and once connected to the GoTech we're just hooking up the green and white lines which are transmit and receive and I'm also powering the GoTech itself using the 5 volt power from the connector itself. This is a freely available utility that came from the STM32 website on this particular laptop, the serial to USB adapter is present as COM7. So in starting up the utility, I've selected that one there. Then you move on to removing the protection from the GoTech firmware. If you're too impatient, it will prompt you with this, but just wait a second. It then recognises the flash memory size. Moving on to the next step, it then shows all the sections in which it's going to flash. And from there, we're going to download to the device a copy of the flash floppy firmware. As of the 2nd of February 2018, the latest version is 097. And we move to the actual flashing stage. It's fairly quick to perform. And that is it. I guess at this point, as a minimum, we have a working GoTech for the Atari and the Amiga. All we have to do now is remove the serial adapter. And also not forgetting to remove the jumper, which only needs to be replaced if we're going to reflash the firmware. Now given I'll be putting this one into an Atari, we need to change the jumpers. So as I mentioned, one has to go on M0. And another one will have to go on S0. Here is a USB stick that I've prepared over time which contains disk images from various uh, groups I guess you could say um, but basically to have the USB stick 
usable by the GoTech, you need to copy two files across. That's the autoboot.hfe file and the config file just below that one. Both of those are available from the HXE website. The disk images on this USB are in the .st format, which the flash floppy firmware recognises, and it also recognises the HFE format. Now, the HFE format, I believe, is able to cater for um, more uh, difficult type uh, disk images, where um, timing and, and, and sector size may vary and that sort of thing. But by default, this works quite happily with the um, ST images. The only difference between the two I've noticed is that uh, while the ST images can typically be in the size of a standard double-sided double-density disk, so you're looking between 730 to 800K, uh, the HFE format with all its uh, extra information uh, can be up to 2 megabytes. Here's a GoTech drive set up with my Mega ST for testing. So what you'll note in connecting the floppy drive connector that the edge of the connector labelled pins 33 and 34 need to align with pins 1 and 2 on the GoTech. Now this in particular needs a twist on the cable uh, where you probably find some of the standard cables that come with the, the 1040s and the 520s aren't long enough so you may need an extension but otherwise that's ready to go. The two jumpers are in place as well, so now we'll give it a test. As a side note, this is actually the GoTech set up in a Mega STE. You don't need the twist of the floppy drive connector on this particular computer. You can see there, pin one goes directly to pin one on the GoTech there. Here we have the USB stick inst inserted into the GoTech. I'm just powering up the Mega ST. You'll see that on the LED display there, it flashes up F hyphen F for flash floppy. That shows that the flash took place. And it defaults to slot zero, which is a disk manager. There it is there. I will reset it again just to show the behavior of the ST. As you can see here, I'm running TOS 206 and it'll boot straight in there. A little message there regarding the use of uh, the non HXC firmware, which can be ignored. And now you can see the disk images uh, all displayed there from the flash USB flash drive. What we'll do is we'll just grab one of the demos. Now you'll note I've got some MSA disk formats there. Um, they're not actually recognized by the firmware. So in selecting one image, we assign it to slot one. Now I'll just press F7 to reboot. Now I have a hard drive in this one, so it will generally reboot into uh, that disk manager rather than the, the uh, floppy drive itself, but I've disconnected it for now. As you can see there, it's loaded the, the demo disk quite quickly. Riveting viewing while it decrunches. Now you can see here that um, there are two LEDs while we're waiting for that to occur. This one's for disk activity, and this one's for power. And as you can hear now, the demo has started. And that is basically the minimum you have to do to have a working GoTech drive in your Atari. Here is another GoTech that I'd prepared earlier. This shows, I guess, another level of modifications that can be performed. Some very nice features are introduced by a few extra steps. 
the most basic one was actually just simply drilling a hole here so the power LED is uh, visible. Um, we also have an enlarged window here on the drive that has a OLED display and you'll see the benefits of that shortly. Basically it gives you more information about the disk image it's loaded as well rather than just the I guess ambiguous uh, numerical display. I'll show you the back of the mounting of that. As you can see there uh, a lot of hot glue was applied and that just keeps it in place. Another set of jumpers that are available are for the buzzer to um, I guess provide an audio cue that some disc activities are taking place. These here, I guess you can purchase them, but I went to a PC recycler, grabbed an old um, Intel motherboard and just desoldered that from it. So reusing just some existing things. Also here I have the rotary encoder. This allows you to dial through all your selections and also by using this particular one, which has a button included in the in the dial there, you can eject the discs. You can see by default the some PCBs won't have two header pins here, so I had to add a header pin there for the encoder, and otherwise they'll reuse some other jumpers. Now I'll give a quick demonstration. So a much more informative uh, cue on what's actually being displayed. So it shows the flash floppy firmware version and as you can hear as it's loading the disk you've got track and sector activity changing as well as uh, the buzzer going as well as it's doing the read. And you can also clearly see now that the power LED is on. Back to the screen you can see it's loading the same demo as well. Now you find that the OLED display will power off after a little while. Um, any sort of activity will show how it's changed. So if we attempt to do the change of the disk images then that will light up the display again. It'll power off shortly. Now in turning the rotary encoder you can see it now it switches between the two disk images which are in place. Also you can see that that's the demo disk image I'm pushing the button there. It now says ejected. Pushing it again then remount the disk. Here's a close-up look of where the piezo buzzer plugs into. So as you can see there, it just goes across the JB set of pins. It's very straightforward to um, install. I guess the challenge for me is, is tidying all this up and having it nicely mounted within the case. With the rotary encoder, it utilises the two extra pins here, draws power from the connector there and it also sends some extra information across pins JA there. I hope you found the video informative. Day-to-day -day use I use the GoTech and these guys are now basically ornamental for me.